Melissa, Hi. it's nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks so much for the invitation to join you. I'm so happy to be doing this video with my friend, Melissa Ho from WWF. Um, my name is Pimali Kodikara and I am the series producer and co-host of a fabulous podcast on feminist solutions to the climate crisis. Um, casually trying to save the planet over here as women do. Uh, but I co-host the show with the former president of Ireland, Mary Robinson, and comedian Maeve Higgins. And we talk to women all over the planet who are on the front lines of the climate crisis and uh, are working on solutions to get, uh, to get the job done. Um, but today we're doing an episode recap on our episode on agriculture um, with Melissa, who is a deep expert on agricultural issues so I'm really excited to get into the conversation today. How are you Melissa? Wonderful thanks so much Molly nice to see you. You too it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be awesome and I look forward to the conversation. Let me first start with uh, reflecting on your opening comments about you know when people's basic fundamental needs are met how uh, there's either conflict or there's despair and people have to migrate because basic water is not available or basic food security needs. And this is really what's looming ahead of us with the climate crisis. Um, but the two episodes, the two interviews you had in your last episode are very interesting and they're highlighting, you know, broader issues for sure in the food security sector. So the first around diversity of germplasm and, you know, thinking of... What is germplasm? Germplasm it is sounds the... excellent. It sounds like it should be in a <laughs> Ghostbusters movie. And it's like a, yeah, it's a gooey <laughs> uh, slime. Um, yeah, it's really, you know, all of the genetic material and the diversity of life to get the different flavors we think of in tomatoes oh, wow, yeah. or the different smells we get in spices or, you know, there's like a dozen kinds of vanilla, right? Or cinnamon where, you know, wine has a terroir from the soil, but also the grape varieties. Wow, Imagine yeah. that for the food we eat. So within a species, within like a certain kind of plant, like a tomato, for instance, I just kept bringing up tomato, but imagine all the different kinds of grains we could eat separate from just corn and maize, right? or wheat. Um, and so there's, you know, a dozen, maybe 15, 16 kinds of species of plants that make up now more than 75% of the global calories and diet in the world. And that's because globalization has put us on a path of eating the same things, right? We mostly eat corn, rice, and wheat, some kind of pasta bread, or love all those things, nothing against them. You know, there's chicken, fish, and, uh, and uh, beef, right? But think of what there could have and used to be in the diversity of cultures we have. You know, we've, di right. we've discovered quinoa, we've discovered um, all kinds of different fruits and vegetables and grains, right? There's buckwheat, um, there's all sorts of things that we are missing out on and that we have lost. And so um, there is an, there is a, um, uh, initiative and a play in the world to save this diversity of food, uh, both all the variety within a given kind of plant, as well as between different kinds of plants. And there's actually, you know, what, um, what was happening in, in the first interview in Palestine with the seed saver, there is a global seed saver happening in a big vault in, uh, in, in, Norway. <laughs> yes, in Norway, yes. small vault, that they're saving seeds and germplasm that can be used by scientists sometime in the future if ever we need it, right? If things go extinct or, or, and it's important because of the cultural diversity and flavor, but it's also important for our survival because if climate change comes and we need different kinds of traits, right? Different kinds of abilities of plants to withstand drought or salty soils or um, different kinds of pests or kinds of things that we don't know about now, if we've lost that diversity 
of you know biology we don't know if there are certain traits in there that we could have lost and we need for future uh, for the future as well so they have those things held up there very nicely cataloged kind of like what <laughs> what she was doing and treasured and saved so that if if we need them for the future we we can use them i love this point about flavor actually because even in researching this episode you know i was really thinking about species and you know it was it was still very creative in the sort of the the thinking about how you know how people are innovating around around uh food systems but flavor sort of brings it back home doesn't it it makes it really personal and that's what was so great in the way that vivian talked about her experiences with seeds and growing these magical seeds and bringing them back to life something that looks so dead and then it comes back to life and it gives all these um this palette of flavors but also the memories attached to those flavors that's and, right you know it's um that you know this this idea of diversity keeps coming back up as well and the importance of diversity in flavor in species you've heard the buzz uh <laughs> we um we actually just released um uh, our flagship scientific report is called the living planet report mm -hmm. and for the last 40 years almost 50 years we've been tracking uh, populations of biodiversity across the planet and it's across species so everything from little insects things in the water wow. you know, fish to big mammals to birds uh, and we've got scientists we partner with around the globe you know so in all the different continents um, and across ecosystems and biomes and so every two years this report comes out uh, and so far, we've been tracking using data since 1970. Uh, and this sounds so fun. Yeah, you have it's a record been... of all the biodiversity on the planet yeah. since 1970. Yeah, and been tracking the population sizes and representation. And I can tell you, it's not good. The the trends and oh. the um, you know the story right now is not good. So for consistently over those last you know almost 50 years less than less than 50 years time we've lost on average globally um, around 68 percent of of the terrestrial populations of vertebrates yeah of, of large uh animals and on on the planet uh 68 and freshwater ecosystems are even worse because there's much more they're much more stressed so they've lost on average of 84 percent so that means those populations wow. are gone and we're losing as i said you know where we can have a seed vault to save plant biodiversity right especially the seed vault is more towards for agriculture mm -hmm. we are not able to save we don't have a noah's ark and a vault to save all of the biodiversity of life that we are losing and have lost you know in in less than a single lifetime and so i think for us the clarion call and the sense of urgency that this report brings isn't just tracking the number of being the canary in the coal mine you know the 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 status of the world's biodiversity and life on the planet is not good the report also tracks what are the drivers uh, that are causing this decline right why and right and and it's clear that it is man-made, right? right. Um, and we've got other, there's other international reports done by the UN. So there's a climate change report, especially looking at land use. There was a special commission similar to the climate commission that was looking just at biodiversity. Those reports come out less frequently. They're like every, you know, 10 years or something like that. They have a global commission. Those only support that the IPBS report on biodiversity came out last year and only supports what we um, are saying, uh, but ours is coming out more frequently. So people cite ours more often because the data is more consistent. So wow. it, it, it's it's looking at the drivers of change and it's unequivocally that in the, in the short span of the 50 or 60 years that humans have uh, really ramped up our consumption, our footprint, we are driving that change at reckless pace at unprecedented rates. Um, and so you see the impacts now in, in the loss of the of the species. And is that when you say man made impacts is is there sort of a ratio balance between environmental impacts versus climate impacts? Um, yeah, so climate is only feeding back negatively on causing the decline in biodiversity. 
Um, and a lot of the drivers of change in biodiversity loss are also drivers of change for climate. So um, things like land use conversion is a major one. And so agriculture is definitely implicated in that, right? Mm -hmm. So agriculture, you know, we're clearing forest land, beautiful Amazon grasslands oh, in North yeah. America and, and um, pampas and savannas in South America. Um, you know, for agriculture, whether it's beef or soy, uh, you know, there's rainforest in Indonesia for, you know, palm oil and other kinds of commodities. Um, there's uh, also pollution and degradation and infrastructure development, right? Uh, so agriculture is also a, a huge source of nutrient and chemical runoff, which is bad for the environment. Obviously, it's a huge user of water. Mm -hmm. So water stress is a big one and climate change only exacerbates and feeds right. back on right. water scarcity. So a lot of these things are reinforcing. Um, and there's a lot of things where um, there are some differences in the drivers, but there are some of the things that are the same. So again, WWF's role, I think, in what we're doing is trying to reinforce the change needed to support ag being part of the solution for climate, but also making sure we don't lose sight of ag's issues and, and the challenges and the things that we need to do to be a part of the solution for nature, right? Water and exactly. soil, which yes. is in addition to climate, right? It's not just, yes, it is about carbon and emissions, but it's also about clean water and pollinators and a healthy soil, right? And biota, soil biota and things like that. Soil, yeah. soil microorganisms. That's Sorry. what I really loved about the concept of silvopasture because the you know partially because it's both ancient and modern practices yeah. integrated which is like finally we're recognizing that indigenous wisdoms are something we probably totally. should have been listening to the entire time but also the fact that it's you know you can grow in the ground you can grow on the ground you can grow above the ground so you've got three time horizons of of uh, of um food harvesting happening but also because of the ground cover um soil cover that you are that they are it is possible to sequester so much more carbon that's right out of the atmosphere and you can still have cows being reared on that on that land um and not in a detrimental way and actually like an augmentative way so um yeah yeah sorry if you I wanted agree. to yeah, yeah, no, I thank you again for bringing up the second interview too. And the, you know, the contrast or the difference in the system that you highlighted in that interview. Um, and I think what you just described and what that interview um, was exemplary for is sort of the complexity of systems and how we, uh, the ancient wisdom and old ways, right? Agroecology, agroforestry, yes. um, and basically farming with nature, farming with trees, farming with animals and trees, right? That's what silvopastoral is. Mm -hmm. are. The idea of adding in complexity in the system so that you use the contributions um, they take and give to the system in harmony, right? There's not over extraction and optimization of just one aspect. Um, and we've, and, and it's also sort of a relationship of what that system needs. So animals provide manure, so you don't need fertilizer as much. Right. Right? Um, and then they also help graze. And then you've got different kinds of crops that you are rotating through, right? It's complex and it's, it's, you need to be thinking, right? You don't, <laughs> It's not just like um, you sit back and just do on a schedule. You have to manage it uh, very actively, um, but it's beautiful, right? And it's um, it, and it it's it, it is in line with nature. It doesn't need a lot of extra things if if all of it can work together in circularity. So. I do think that there is a lot that we have left behind and we have forgotten. And it is an interesting to see the movement around regenerative agriculture yes. has so many, it's not rocket science. It's not something shiny and new. It is many of the same concepts and principles and mindsets that we started with and it is coming full circle. But the thing that I do love about it, that it's not just romanticizing old ways. It's not just going back to only small is beautiful. There is a modern 21st century aspect about it with like 
remote sensing and the best data systems, right, that you can use. Um, it does require, you know, new technologies and you still do mm -hmm. want good, you know, breeding and science to be engaged. Um, and I think a lot of the best regenerative ag systems, farmers are really using tools, you know, handheld iPads out in the field to track and help with that complexity in management, right? So like, we don't, we don't have to there's something in between we can evolve and move forward but not lose the mindset and the approach of farming with nature absolutely we had a guest um in season two who um she developed the zero waste design guidelines for new york city mm. um but she had uh, she's a specialist in biomimicry and she oh, made cool. this point <laughs> it's so cool right it's like i almost want to drop everything oh. and go and study biomimicry oh, yeah. but she um made this wonderful statement about how she realized that there is no waste in nature. And that's where this whole concept came from was like, maybe we're doing something wrong right. if there's no, if we're creating so much waste output and whilst we, putting we, stress on the yeah, on the planet. So. Right. We, we've we made a linear system versus a circular one right. of where, I don't know, um, it might be overplayed now and everyone's seen it, but there's a great movie that sort of took that concept and, and watched the evolution of a farm, the biggest little farm. Oh, I haven't seen um, it. Oh, it's lovely. And I kind of went into it thinking, okay, it's going to be cliche and I'm going to hate it, but I loved it. And I, it's a great movie if you have kids or have people that are interested in agriculture, but, um, aren't hardcore ag people. It was a couple from LA who <laughs> bought a farm because of their dog. They couldn't live in the apartment anymore and they had this dream. But with every year they had to add more complexity to their system to create a, a full system, right? They had to restore a dead landscape. Rewild um, and, it basically. Yes, and yeah. add each little component. Like they had one problem and then the, the next thing came in to help solve that problem. And then that introduced another problem. And then the next thing came in. And so over the every turn of the year, they added more complexity until the system was complete. And it, it's such, it was so beautiful and, and just really inspiring. It's really, really wonderful talking to you, Melissa. So how can Likewise. people read the Sustainable Diets report when it comes out next week? When does it come out? Um, so the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, we will be releasing a global report uh, really highlighting and elevating the importance of diets and uh, choosing sustainable diets for addressing climate change and nature loss. Uh, that should that report should come out this month, later this month. Um, yeah, we're super excited. It will focus on both what we need to do to bend the curve on biodiversity loss and Brilliant. where diets play a role, as well as uh, look at elevating what we're calling a planet-friendly diet. Oh, I'm into it. I just need somebody to just tell me what to do and I will do it. I promise I will do it. But I'm so glad that you guys are just putting it together in the report for me. So to make it easy, it's great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and then in terms of Mothers of Invention, we are a podcast on feminist solutions to the climate crisis. Um, it's hosted by the former president of Ireland, Mary Robinson, who is currently chair of The Elders, um, and comedian Maeve Higgins, and myself. Um, I have series produced the show, um, but uh, have been roped into co-hosting this year. So, <laughs> but it's a lot of, it's a good time. Thanks, Melissa. Please stay in touch. Likewise. Thanks so much.